Hello and welcome to another edition of Positive Leadership, the podcast that helps you grow as an individual leader and ultimately as a global citizen. One of the themes I want to explore more on this podcast today is the concept of meaningful time, the time we spend that truly matters in our lives. We're all on the same trajectory through time, but how we spend our time can vary drastically. Time and time management fascinates people, intrigues, and perplexes us in a way how we organize our lives while making time for the things that satisfy and fulfill us. That's an age-old question indeed. My guest today, Professor Elena Boniwell, has extensively researched relationship between time perception, well-being, and eventually happiness. Uh, best-selling author, academic as well. She actually edited the first master's degree in applied positive psychology in Europe. She's one of the European leaders in that field of positive psychology, uh, but she's also a coach and she has developed her own approach to positive psychology coaching based on her findings and has delivered a program to thousands of coaches and top executives around the world using many tools and even some games we're going to talk a little bit about. So, such enormous pleasure to have you on the podcast, Ilona. A very warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And um, I know it's going to be fascinating in terms of your questions, discussions. So, I'm delighted. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. <laughs> and looking forward to all the insights and incredible uh, depths in the topics we're going to discuss. <laughs> so, you've been researching, studying, teaching, writing, coaching, consulting for 20 years. And I believe you are trained under Martin Seligman often referred to as the father of positive psychology. So can you tell us about the origin of your interest in positive psychology, how you discovered that field, and why? I'm also very interested, Ilona, always with my guests, on the why you have decided to dedicate your life to it. Well, I was very fortunate to have discovered positive psychology in 1999, given that positive psychology only started in 1998. And I was very fortunate to discover it almost by chance, in fact. <laughs> so at the time, I was still a young student yep. studying psychology, mm -hmm. psychology as usual, mm -hmm. and organizing student congresses and conferences. So when I was just preparing to organize my first student congress for the British Psychological Society, I asked my team members, what should it be on? And somebody just came up with this idea, positive psychology. Hmm. I went, <laughs> so what's positive psychology? <laughs> and he answered, this is Professor Alex Lindley, another uh -huh. really known person nowadays. Yeah. And he answered, well, that's about the scientific study of happiness and well-being. Uh -huh. What really makes sense to people yeah. and how people can thrive. And I went, oh, my God, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> and so we did organize that conference on positive psychology. Yeah. We organized another one a year later. Mm. And a year later, I had a surprise encounter yeah. because I was running yet another Congress. That's 2001 now. So it takes a year to organize a conference yeah. usually. <laughs> 2001, I keep running this student Congress still. I'm just finishing my undergraduate studies yeah. and preparing for postgraduate, probably in clinical psychology. Uh -huh. And I'm there all day long. And all day long, there is this guy <laughs> sitting and listening t to all the presentations. Yeah. And he's kind of not that young. <laughs> And I wanted to come and ask him if he's a mature student <laughs> and what brings him here. <laughs> You're curious. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't. Okay. Because at the very end of this conference, uh -huh. he comes and, s and actually shakes my hand and says, thank you very much. That was really interesting. My name is Martin Seligman. Ooh. Would you like to have a coffee with me? <laughs> and of course, you had heard about Martin Seligman at the time. No, obviously. <laughs> but you know, this is pre-Google, <laughs> yeah, pre-knowing yeah, 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 yeah. everybody's faces. So <laughs> yes. he just... And so we had that coffee. Wow. And he asked me this amazing question. Hmm. What can I do to help you start positive psychology in Europe? Hmm. I was like, OK, just keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could bring together European congresses. We could bring together European network of positive psychology, et cetera, et cetera. I said, OK, well, go ahead and do it. Hmm. And what happened for me in this moment hmm. is that up until that moment, I thought positive psychology could be a passion. That's fine. Yeah. But it couldn't be a career. Hmm. It couldn't be something I really would do yeah. fundamentally yeah. as a work. Just yeah. read about it, etc. Yeah. I was going into clinical at that point. Yeah. And really this moment shifted hmm. like the, sort of the arrow from impossible 
to possible. Wow. And I went, <laughs> why can't it, why can't be a positive psychologist? I can. So I actually went ahead and studied and yeah. did my PhD. The only way at that yeah. moment was to do a PhD in positive psychology. Uh -huh. And so this is how yeah. I became a positive psychologist. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing in the sense that, oh, uh, one conversation one with conversation. one person. Yes. With one question. With one question. One question set you on that mission for your life. Absolutely. That's that's fascinating. Absolutely. <laughs> I had a couple of those conversations in my life, this one question, huh. but the importance of one question. Yes. So when we think about coaching, for example, it's mm. very often not about the formal coaching session, in fact. Yes. It is sometimes about this asking this really important question in the right moment. To make you reflect, to make exactly. you think deeply about it. Exactly, yeah. which is why yeah. actually the management coach posture yeah. or leadership coach positioning is so effective or yes. can be so effective. It's about asking those questions in those micro, micro moments of time. Hmm. Love it. And it's, it's a theme, uh, you know, we've been discussing quite a lot on that podcast with a, a couple of guests, including my friend Michael Bungestani as well, <laughs> on, on the coaching habits. One area of research that interests you greatly, I think, is perceived time use and time perspective. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me the different time perspectives and build them out a little? Of course. In fact, when we talk about time, there are lots of different theories and sort of concepts. And actually, in fact, to really understand somebody's time, you need mm -hmm. to probably dive into all of them. But I have a couple of preferred, the preferred ones. So one of them is this notion of time perspective. Mm -hmm. Time perspective is a notion that was originally developed in 1960s, 1970s, and really picked up by somebody called Philip Zimbardo. Mm -hmm. So the same Phil Zimbardo, yep. you know, with Stanford Prison Experiment, mm -hmm. et cetera, who really researched it quite substantially over the past 30 years. Yeah. And so uh, the notion of time perspective, it's really about where do you position your thoughts mm. at any given point mm -hmm. in time? Are you more focused on the future, on the here and now, on the present, or on the past? The past. In fact, we're talking about five different time perspective profiles. Mm. So the future time perspective is really about constantly thinking what next, yeah. next goals, yeah. what, so yeah. I completed something, yeah. tick off, Done. off the box, that next, 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 coming, okay. coming etc. coming. Yeah. The present time perspective has two orientations, the mm. present hedonistic, which is really about enjoying the present moment. So yeah. let's say you have a really important meeting tomorrow, mm -hmm. so, and you have a really great party tonight. Yeah. So do you go to bed early because the meeting is really important? Or do you enjoy the night? Or do you enjoy <laughs> the party because we yeah. only live once, yes. right? <laughs> That's uh, yeah. present hedonistic. Uh, present fatalistic, it's also about oriented, being oriented to the present, mm. but more in a sense that there is nothing you can do to control the future. Mm. So fatalistic it means there is nothing I can do to change what's going to come. Mm -hmm. So what's the point in trying? So let's just, I don't know, keep playing video games, for yeah. example, because yeah, there is yeah. nothing else to do, <coughs> right? And then you have two past orientations as well. Mm -hmm. So past positive, past yeah. positive is really kind of bringing back lo lovely memories, the good memories, nice good memories, memories yes. nostalgic mm. sometimes, slightly mm. nostalgic, <laughs> sort of yeah. really continuing the tradition, yep. connecting with family, friends, mm -hmm. usually having lots of friends who come from yep. the age of five, etc. Yep. And then past negative, <laughs> it's <laughs> all the same, but mainly focusing on the negative, negative events from yeah. your past yes. and actually having those memories spontaneously come up. Coming back in your mind. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And so your time perspective is actually where do you spend most of the time? Huh. And so one of my passions is to understand what's the relationship between time perspective and well-being. Hmm. And in fact, research shows hmm. that, let's say, present hedonistic time perspective is associated with some aspects of well-being, with positive emotions, yep. but not necessarily with life satisfaction mm. because, well, you end up doing some things that you might regret afterwards. Yep. Yep. The past positive time perspective is also really helpful for well-being mm. because there is a sense of continuity, yeah. temporal continuity that you're actually mm. sort of bringing with you. And future time perspective is kind of a hit and miss a little bit mm. <laughs> because <laughs> there are some aspects associated yeah. with well-being and some not too much because also future time perspective very often leads us to be far more workaholism oriented right. and not yeah. necessarily taking enough time yes. for ourselves. To enjoy the day. Yes. yes. And of course, uh, you probably <laughs> asked me this in the next question, <laughs> like, can't we have all of the above? Oh, of course. <laughs> right? <laughs> and in fact, we can. Yeah. So the notion of the balanced time perspective is really about being capable to flexibly shift between this focus on the past, 
on the present, past positive, present positive, present hedonistic, yes. yeah. and the future, depending on the current situational demands. Hmm. So when you have this family in France, yeah. it's a great idea to be in the past. Yeah. When you are working, it's a good idea to be in the future. Hmm. But when you finished working, it's a really good idea not to be in the future anymore right. yes. when you're falling asleep yeah. and not going through your Go list of things to, to do <laughs> for to tomorrow. Do yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a tra- it's a good yeah. idea yeah. to actually focus on the present moment. Yeah. So it's the capacity, it's mm. cognitive flexibility and this capacity to shift between mm. these sort of temporal zones, yeah. which does also affect the way we use our time. No, it's a, good, it's a great, great framework to actually reflect again whenever we can and and that's something else we'll discuss and how we can enable ourselves to to understand where we navigate in our mind on those five spaces absolutely because <laughs> in many ways our western culture places a strong value on future time perspective very working towards future goals rewards often at the expense of present enjoyment and as we know it's not enough to fulfill us and bring us satisfaction mm-hmm. and that like so many facets of our life balance is the key so how do you coach people to truly create a more balanced um, perspective. <laughs> so they are not confused about those five exactly. I mean, spaces. In fact, you know, I mean, there, there are different ways to measure time perspective. So actually measuring could enable me to position somebody already yeah. where they are at. And really the start of the coaching here is to understand where the person is at. Mm. So because the coaching would be very different Depending for somebody on, yeah. who is really high on the future time perspective mm. or somebody, let's say, who doesn't have or have very, very low level of future time perspective, for mm. example. So if somebody is really high, my coaching would be much more focused on the balancing it out with the present, on enabling, for example, to yeah. take time, <laughs> enabling themselves to sort of <coughs> allowing themselves, allow themselves give allowing, permission. Yeah, giving yeah. permission to yeah. take, time, take the time to yeah. enjoy, yeah. sometimes even just working out what does it mean to enjoy yeah. yes. <laughs> what does it mean what does pleasure actually yeah. mean to you <laughs> what is pleasure what c- etc yes. so yeah. and very often somebody with a really high future time perspective will always be mm. in this constant optimization yeah. trap yes thinking that they can optimize better and better all and better. the time yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, and they'll yeah. be really really passionate about all the <laughs> time management tools yes but that's precisely what they don't need to do mm. But they'll be really, really susceptible. (laughs) So I can do it better and I can do it even faster. They never satisfy themselves, right? They're never satisfied by what they can do. (laughs) Exactly, because you can always go much faster and much much better and optimize even more. (laughs) And somebody who doesn't, let's say, have a really well developed future time perspective, the focus is completely different. It's sometimes about setting goals. I remember I had a very first coaching client. I had a sort of funny, interesting sort of situation. I remember I was like being trained as a coach at the time mm-hmm. and I was in front of her saying, so, uh, so tell me what goal would you like to work on? And she looks at me and says, do you know, I understand the word goal, hmm. but I do not get it. Huh. I don't understand what it actually means, means? to have a goal or to yeah. set a goal. Ah. Well, I had a great coaching experience. <laughs> Must have been a very interesting discussion. <laughs> exactly. So that's a really good example of somebody yes. who doesn't have yes. a really well-developed yes. future time yes. perspective. So yeah. the focus would be completely different. Yeah. So let's keep building on the discussion, Ilona. In your fantastic book, Pos- Positive Psychology, Coaching in the Workplace, you introduce the notion of time crunch, mm. the feeling of being rushed, and some alarming, although not terribly sur- unsurprising data, that 61% of the population reported never having excess time. So is this phenomenon of feeling rushed a new phenomenon? Uh, and if we get less time now, or do, we, or do you think it's actually more about increasing demands on our time? Mm. What's really interesting is that the recent research actually suggests that there are even more people feeling time crunch huh. or time famine. So we're Keeps talking growing. about 70% wow. or even 80% Oof. nowadays. So this number is growing really Keeps rapidly. It's growing, yeah. Absolutely. So it's a relatively new phenomenon, new in the sense of the couple of uh, two, three decades sort of old. So we're not talking yep. about really, really old phenomenon. And it's what is really interesting about it is that this phenomenon, this time crunch, does not necessarily correspond to time use data mm. that sociologists, for example, collect. Yep. So when we look at how many hours people objectively work, and we usually ask them to complete mm-hmm. time diaries, mm-hmm. and we can actually measure yep. the amount of yep. hours, so there is a real sort of difference between mm. how much people work and they work actually less hmm. overall, and what they think 
the how perception much of the time they work. They spend, yes. Exactly, yeah. the yeah. perception yeah. of time. Yeah. And so there is really, really interesting <laughs> paradox, absolutely yes. amazing, such and stuff, fascinating. And what's really interesting that even though people, in fact, work less, they feel they work more. Huh. So their perception yes. of, the, of time famine time crunch is really important. Hmm. And this perception is actually linked to their stress levels. So even though this perception yes. is not real, yeah. the outcomes are real. Yes. <laughs> so, et so this is where data matters a lot, you know, Absolutely. right? To Absolutely. really measure time, exactly. which I'm, I'm a big, big Absolutely. believer of. And actually. what's <laughs> happening very yeah. often yeah. is that mm. why we have this increased perception of time crunch mm. is because nowadays we cramp mm. many more activities mm. into the same unit of time. Yep. So we have many more emails that we try to answer, many more phone calls, yep. or many more meetings, <laughs> etc. So our perception of our time is so, I mean, our time dense is kind of so dense and yes. so full that this is what's producing this perception yeah. of time crunch. Yes. And what's more, we continue crunching <laughs> huge amount of activities into our leisure time as well. Hmm. So it's not only related to work, but also to leisure. Yeah. Before, people used to just play golf yeah, yeah. on a Saturday. Yeah. And now you <laughs> you have to bring your kids to one activity and or then do the shopping yeah. and then or, or you do your workout and you listen to my podcast. Exactly. <laughs> 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 well, well podcasts actually are quite useful because yeah. that's one of the solutions really? for the so called what sort of time which wasted time we yeah. don't like. Yes. For example, yeah. when you are, let's say, waiting for the plane <laughs> yes. boarding, for yeah. example, yeah. it's a yeah. great time to listen to a podcast, right? <laughs> anyway. anyway, my comment was, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, obviously encouraging my listeners to use uh, the meaningful time they have to, Absolutely. to, to listen to the podcast. Absolutely. As you well know, Ilona, a number of management gurus have developed methodologies to be more productive. I mean, and of course, a very famous one, author by David Allen, is built on five simple steps, capture, clarify, organize, review, engage. And Franklin Covey, the famous Franklin Covey, packaged this into a daily and weekly planner. Absolutely. And all of that, of course, is based on this all-time bestseller author, uh, Stephen Covey, yeah. <laughs> of the seven habits of very effective people. Absolutely. Where he demonstrated a paradigm shift can help you achieve the big things in your to-do list while managing the little things. Absolutely. His philosophy consists in enabling people to have a deeper engagement with their lives. So my question is, what is your advice about the practical <laughs> steps people can take to plan to plan their time so that they reach that level of well-being and satisfaction? Mm -hmm. It's something I'm confronted all, all the time myself. I'm coaching young entrepreneurs, impact entrepreneurs, and you know they are giving all of their lives to their mission, to that impact they want to see in the world, and yet they are so much stressed about that future, that present. Mm. They talk less about the past, I would say, it's more <laughs> the present and the future. It's a shame, actually. Yeah, it's a very good point. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, it's about discussion about what should they do? What can they, mm. how can they actually shape their time in a way that is meaningful? Well, I wish I could give you just one piece of advice, <laughs> and I cannot. <laughs> the reason I cannot is because fundamentally, with many psychological variables, one size does not fit all. No, of course. So it's really about understanding one's own time traps, hmm. fundamentally. Hmm. For somebody, a time trap can be uh, over-motivation. Yeah. and believing they can absolutely do everything. Everything every day. All every time. day yeah. and <laughs> they can function at their personal best all the time. Yes. For somebody else, time trap could be, in fact, being very scared to be overstretched, for mm -hmm. example, etc. So it's first of all, it's about understanding your own time mm -hmm. traps. That's one, I would say. Second, I think it is a, about shifting the mindset and the value system yep. in terms of what is the value we give to money and time and fundamentally mm. what we do know, people who are more satisfied with their time are actually giving more value to time mm. than to money. Than to money. So yeah. that's a really quite important mm. shift. It's also about not valuing as much being busy because busy, b being busy is a status symbol of nowadays. Yes, <laughs> yes. And it's about letting go of that. And mm. that's a really difficult one. I must yes. admit, I've been working mm. on time for the past 20 years. <laughs> And when people ask me, how are you? I keep saying busy and then, no, 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 stop, stop saying busy, stop <laughs> saying, anyway. Busy, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's also about giving time hmm. because funnily enough, research demonstrates that by giving time, we actually have a perception of having more time hmm. as well. 
And you mean giving time to others or giving time, time to yourself to as, others well? as yeah? well? Okay. Yeah. Giving time to others. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. It's important. It is also about, yes. of course, balancing your time perspective. Yeah. Of course, it is also about ditching things yeah. that don't bring pleasure, fundamentally yes. enjoyment or meaning. Yeah. And really yeah. being sometimes quite harsh in terms of what it is that you ditch. Yes. <laughs> sometimes I do a sort of very simple exercise mm -hmm. with people on using a time bucket to just pick up any kind of yep, yep, cap, yep, for yep, example, yep, yep. and ask people to fill it with little post-its of everything they do <laughs> and ask them, do, do yes. they actually fit? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that doesn't fit? Yep. What doesn't fit? <laughs> Would you like to take it out? How can I take it out? Is there anything that's not there that should be there? Hmm. That's something that's meaningful and important for you that is not in your time yeah. bucket. Yeah. What would you like to add? How? Very simple conversation sometimes. Sometimes producing some really interesting outcomes. So it's not one size fits all. It's understanding your time personality hmm. and fundamentally constantly working on alignment. Hmm. On alignment between your, of course, values and what's really important to you and what it is that you are doing on a daily basis. And of course, yeah, yeah. not really falling too much into time management tricks fundamentally. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's actually very interesting in terms of starting understanding your own time patterns and your yes. time diagnostic in a way before yes. before changing and shaping a bit differently your time. Absolutely, actually. absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, just because <laughs> fundamentally behavioral change yes. is always difficult. It's one person at a time. Yes, and if it's not based on understanding hmm. of the current patterns, yeah. it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work, yeah, I agree with you. So moving away from time slightly, I want to talk to you about well-being and engagement. You've looked at the importance of both well-being and engagement in tandem to create a positive and productive workplace. So can you expand on your ideas of well-being and engagement, how you measure them, what coaching tools you use to foster these two key components? Of course. So there is sometimes um, a mistaken perception. Oh, no. Should I say it a little bit differently? <laughs> there is sometimes this belief mm -hmm. uh, that well-being, engagement, thriving, flourishing, it's all the same thing. It's not. It's not. Yeah. It's not. And what's really sometimes mm -hmm. very helpful is to understand the differences between these notions, understand why they're important in a different way as yep. well, and of course to measure them. Yep. So broadly speaking, when we're talking about well-being mm -hmm. or well-being in the workplace, we are talking about satisfaction is mm. to what extent people are satisfied, for example, with their work they're doing, with their workplace, and to what extent they have more positive emotions than negative emotions. Mm. And it's a really important variable, yep. which also does correlate and predict yes. uh, performance. Yep. 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 When we're talking about engagement, mm. we are talking about people going beyond mm. their current role. Mm. It's not so much about how happy they are with it, but to what extent they're able to really identify with the organization mm. and give sometimes more than it's necessary. Is it a sense, kind of, in a way, it's a sense of belonging as well? It is, also yes. a sense of belonging, yeah. it's a sense of, uh, of really being absorbed in what so, you're doing, yeah. it's, uh, it's really a sense of uh, alliance yeah. with your organization, etc. Yeah. So it's a more active component mm. of thriving, I would say. And so we can really distinguish these two. Both contribute to performance, for example. Yes, yeah. And but, but saying that, engagement contributes slightly more to mm. performance than well-being. The well -being, yes. And what we are ideally <laughs> looking for, we are looking at the really sort of good high levels of both well-being and engagement. Why? Yes. Because engaged people mm. can be performing very highly mm. for a while. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there will come a time yeah. when they will not be able to, <laughs> simply because they don't recover. Yes. Uh, yes. When we're talking about well-being, in the absence of engagement, mm. there is a danger that the person can slip towards more the mm. nine-to-five mentality. Yes. That's my well-being, these are my boundaries, I need to recover. Mm. Well, whatever happens here, I need my well-being time. Yes. And so sometimes in the mm. extreme of well-being, the engagement may be missing. So what we are looking for, mm. we are looking for <laughs> sustainable performance, which will be comprised from both engagement and well-being. Well -being. And of course, we can measure it. We can measure it through emotional data. We can measure it through cognitive data. Yes. I, I can, like for example, uh -huh. explain uh -huh. some of the models yes. in terms of different um, different versions so, yep. uh, that, uh, of well-being, cognitive level well-being that we can measure. So yep. we can measure productivity 
quality engagement, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You can measure more sort of attitude towards relaxed work or even boredom, et cetera, et cetera. So we can measure all the different yeah. cognitive well-being states mm. by using validated questionnaires, for example. Mm. And this is something relatively straightforward nowadays. It's yeah. something that we know how to do. We know how to capture this type of data. Yeah. But your second question, of course, was what do you do? Yes, what do you do about it? It's exactly right. <laughs> okay, we know, that, it's, some, it's we know okay. somebody yes. is kind of somewhere <laughs> yeah, close yeah. to workaholism, is a yeah. little bit <laughs> very engaged and well-being yeah. is not quite there. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. And well, again, I wish the answer was simple. Again, mm. let's press the button and everything works. It's not. Mm. Because for that, we need to look at the predictors of mm. well-being engagement, for example, in the workplace. And there are many. For example, in our model, yep. post organizational profile, we identify approximately 18 major predictors of mm. well-being engagement. Yep. And they will be predicting well-being and engagement slightly differently. differently. So sometimes mm. you would actually start with a different indicator, different predictor, depending on the situation. Mm. So the answer would be is to find what are the most important predictors in this particular context. Mm. What it is that we are looking to increase? Is it yeah. well-being, is it satisfaction, <coughs> is it engagement, etc.? What is it that we are looking perhaps to decrease? Yeah. And then depending on the predictor, let's say the difficulty here yeah. is at the lower level of vi vitality because people have mm -hmm. been really exhausted. Yeah. Or the difficulty here <laughs> is uh, um, perhaps middle management not yeah. quite knowing <coughs> what posture to adopt or perhaps not having had sufficient training, for example, and just specialists being put into management roles. Yes. So depending on the predictor, yeah. the answer of what it is that would you be can very do different. would be very so different. It can be very pointy based on, again, Absolutely. this diagnostic. Absolutely. Plus of a person, I guess, of a team or an Absolutely. entire organization. Absolutely. What is the plan you should have, actually, Absolutely. to get to Yes. The and I think steps. there is a danger yeah. in just prescribing yeah. general solutions. Of course. <laughs> without <laughs> <Between> understanding <laughs> yeah. the actual cause of the issues, the root uh, cause, yeah, the root yeah, cause yeah, yeah, and yeah. same time without understanding mm. what it is that's working well. Mm. Because sometimes some of the fundamental drivers, and this is where positive psychology yeah, yeah, yeah. differs from yeah. the traditional problem solving model, yeah. right? We also need to take into account what is working what well. What is working well, absolutely. What is working what gives well, you energy. What gives place. energy yeah. and how yeah. can we actually mm. build more of On that? that. Yes. And how can we take the examples of yeah. our organization, a team that functions particularly yeah. well, and perhaps sort mm. of use their practices, yeah. use their rituals for the rest of the organization. Yeah, super. So you've got a number of games and tools, a lot of fancy things on the table. Can, can, can we can we go at trying one of them? Absolutely. <laughs> what would you like to try? <laughs> okay. Tell me what you have uh, in store. Well, uh, we <laughs> Briefly, can start, and then we can pick one of them. We can start <laughs> yes. with strength cards, for example, and that's a straightforward exercise okay. to do. Yeah. We can look into positive actions, which is really about yeah. uh, positive psychology interventions, which are appropriate yeah. for at an individual level, or even look at workout. But here I have 180 practices wow, that for positive like organizations. A longer so dialogue. maybe that's a bit long, right? W what about the strength card. It looks like more straightforward conversation. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll see. <laughs> Never played that game, by the way, <laughs> to the listeners. So. <laughs> well, let's try let's, to do let's that, right? Discover that. Okay. Yes. So what we have here? Yep. Okay. Let's try to do a little. Stuff. Yep. I would say coaching <laughs> demonstrations, etc. Yeah. So what we have here? We have sort of different strength cards. Specifically, yes. 50 different strengths cards. Let's yes. just perhaps spread them out. 50, okay. 50 yeah, yeah, different yeah. strengths wow. cards. They are informed, the development of these cards was informed by the comparison between all existing strengths inventories. So mm -hmm. In fact, I think it's probably the most comprehensive set of cards that you could potentially find. And uh, I'm going to just do a couple of exercises with you. You can see yeah. lots and lots of different cards. You might want to just look around at them, etc. And I'm going to ask you a couple of very sort of very simple questions, yep, right? Yep, yep. <coughs> Which is, there we go. We have 50 cards spread approximately on the table. If you were to have a look around, hmm. could you possibly try to identify two or three cards which really represent your top strengths? And what I mean by strengths, well, what I mean by strengths, strength yes. is something, something where you feel authentic. Yes. So it's really kind of, that's me, the spontaneous mm -hmm. sort of recognition. That's, I'm sure that's me. <laughs> It's something where you feel the energy. So mm. when you do it, when you use the strengths, you actually end, end up being more energized mm. and you don't end up being depleted. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's really important. <laughs> and it, of course, it's something that you're good at. Yes. But good at <laughs> in itself is not sufficient. 
because good at is great, but yeah. they're also good at in many competences. So learn behaviors. No. You know, as we progress through our career, we become pretty good at yes. quite a lot of things. So it's not about being good enough. Yeah. It's more than that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's really good yeah. at, on really good at fundamentally. Uh -huh. And the energy. The energy is really important thing here. It's because when we're talking about competences, we are good at it, but the energy part is missing. I mean, hmm. sort of, I don't know, let's say you are, you have developed a good capacity to be a listener and you can listen really well, but yeah. you come out of a listening session, let's say, and you feel, I'm tired. <laughs> so that's not a strength, <laughs> okay, yes, for example. Yes, yes. So something that you are really confident that you, it is your strength. And once you have found this kind of couple of chords, couple of strengths that you're mm. really confident you really have them, I would like you to give me a story hmm. <laughs> that illustrates an example, a practical example of using that strength. Wow, those are big questions, Ilona, and a lot to think about because I'm, I'm just contemplating for you on the podcast like fifty. <laughs> yes, I know. Fifty cars. You can like move them around. Critique, equality, open-mindedness, social connection, a time of dissemination. Actually, we talked about resilience, uh, detail, courage, curiosity, harmony, hard work. I mean, love, action, kindness. Anyway, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so much to <laughs> contemplate and, and it's pretty hard as you all know to, to reflect on yourself because as you may know I think we discussed it together I did this exercise with Kim Cameron which yeah. was the best self poetry but what was easier for me is that uh, I got the feedback from others not from yeah. me who told me <laughs> their stories about hey yes. I think this is where JP Strands came, came to life yeah. and now I have to think about that with my eyes, eh, which yes. is <laughs> so. Let me maybe take a couple of minutes no to, to, to <laughs> just pick those two or three things and reflect on it. <clears throat> there could be a version of this exercise where we go through <laughs> all of these cards, really, and you would have to sort it into: oh. is that your strengths? Is wow. that your competence or is that your potential? Wow, how many <laughs> days do you spend on that? <laughs> no, more than half an hour, surprisingly enough. Uh, okay. <laughs> and if you don't find a strength, you can use a green joker card. Oh, you get a joker card. <laughs> I have no strengths at all. <laughs> no confidence in myself. <laughs> uh. So how are you doing? Well, I'm perplexed, of course. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> you don't, it, it's, yeah. it's just two or three strengths. Yeah. You might yeah. have seven or ten signature no, strengths. No, uh, not, uh, not that many, two but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to, to pick new things, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Maybe let me, let me give it a go and try. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so I selected three cards. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership. Yep. Learning, teamwork. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you give me a story for each of them, please? Wow. Okay. <laughs> and indeed, I could, um, I could have different stories so for <laughs> each one of them. And let's let's start with one. Uh, leadership is certainly something I, I got to, well, to learn to actually even understand the concept of leadership by. Well, by doing it, by being a, a first line manager at Microsoft in my 25, 26 years old <laughs> age at the time. And, uh, and since that time, I've, I've been enjoying so much. I think what I'm calling the privilege to be a leader. And by the way, I think that anyone can be a leader. I don't mean you need to be promoted <laughs> to what to be promoted to be a leader. But not to get back to uh, maybe a story, uh, because that's the exercise. Uh, Clearly, one of the one of the maturity story in, in a way of my leadership 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 style evolution as well uh, has been the story of uh, what I learned at Microsoft at of Microsoft in in the sense of what it takes to transform hmm. an organization to uh, a different mission. And you know, story at Microsoft is that eight years ago we are a software company. Uh, we're building some great software for customers. Uh, we had a mission at the time, which was to uh, that one day it will be a you know there will be actually a PC on every desk in every home. But we thought that was not enough, and that was not relevant anymore in a way in the world we're living in. And so as a company, we embark on transformation, 
And long story short, is a new mission to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. Which means back in 2015, 2016, that mm. we were considering changing, rewiring Microsoft completely to become a cloud and AI first company. And I was in charge of the sales force of the company at the time, the global sales force. And in many ways, it was about asking 35,000 people across the planet <laughs> to evolve from being great sellers of software licenses to our customers, to companies, to businesses, to become actually the trusted advisor to customers to their digital transformation. And that's that's like a gigantic reinvention of yourself. And, and at the time, I, I decided and I'm going to make this long story a shorter one because I discussed a little bit of that in some of the podcast episodes, particularly, particularly with Michael Bungestani on coaching. I decided to try to train and learn myself how to become a coach mm. so, that, so that I could learn myself the new skills needed for all the 35,000 people to be successful. And I decided to jump and dive into that learning, very uncomfortable space. Mm. <laughs> of changing my behaviors, of rewiring the skills, but the hard skills, but a lot of soft skills on how should I change the way I manage people, the way I live with people across the globe to become myself a trusted advisor and to get them to grow and to show them that they have the ability in themselves with a lot of very incredible smart people <laughs> to reinvent themselves as a trusted advisor of the customers. So that's maybe the story which could go on and on and on Absolutely. of uh, leadership where uh, I, the way I think about leadership and the way I think about leadership being uh, hopefully trying to be a role model, exemplary yourself and kind of doing what you're asking your people to do and being in the middle of the trenches as well. Yeah. That's beautiful and can hear already another of your strengths coming through the story. So maybe learning, <laughs> it's a little bit of learning, but I'm going to take, take Take another story for learning. <laughs> uh, I love learning. I think I, I, I love learning for many, many, many years in my life, decades in many ways. Uh, in a way, I, I learned from my dad, who uh, I could see himself uh, reinventing himself in his life as a doctor, and after retired, becoming an author of a book and and building wonderful, uh, you know, uh, models as well, doing some modeling, a lot of things. And he was learning Spanish, learning new things <laughs> when he was retired. And he has a new life. And I said, wow, that's, that's kind of actually exciting and inspiring. And, and so all along my career, but probably even more so, I must admit, I was not necessarily great at that for many years. I decided to uh, invest and dedicate a lot of more of my time now, for sure, a lot more to uh, all the change makers in the world. You know, the people we we call social entrepreneurs, we call these days them impact entrepreneurs. And so for the last decade, in a way, I've been spending voluntarily a lot of more time connecting with such people, learning from them, <laughs> learning from the great role models, from uh, the founder of Ashoka, you know, Bill Drayton, I had on my podcast, actually, <laughs> to many incredible social entrepreneurs, change makers in the world to learn, number one, what has been driving them to do that, to dedicate their life, you know, back to our discussion before on time <laughs> and purpose. Wow, those people are purpose led like big time. And then to learn from there what it would take to actually uh, use that energy to build my own foundation with my family, which I did seven years ago called If For Good. And what I did there was, and keeps going, an incredible learning community where I keep learning both from the coaching session I'm having with some young entrepreneurs because they, you know, I, I learn as much as hopefully they learn from me as well, <laughs> but also with the beneficiaries of all their causes and enterprise they do, which are wonderful, whether, whether it is people with handicaps or people with, you know, who are recycling plastics to, <laughs> to have a more sustainable society. So long story short, I love learning. Uh, that would be another story. But I'm going to stop there. And just the session we have right now with to, the two of us, you know, is all about learning. I'm fascinated because I met with a few of your peers, as you know, in the US, in Europe as well. And each one of you is bringing me some new facets of that positive psychology, <laughs> positive leadership, which I, I love. I love and keep keep building on it. Beautiful. 
Absolutely beautiful. And I could listen to your story and keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> I think the third card I picked, uh, and again, there's so many vibrancy, many other cards, <laughs> I would say, is teamwork. And why did I pick teamwork? Because I think since very young, actually with my favorite sports, which is football, I mean, the real football, not soccer, I mean, but the same thing. <laughs> I, I, I've loved always being part of the team. And, you know, I was young, playing in a, in a football uh, role as a libero at the time, it was the, the technical term for the, that role <laughs> of a player. And then all along my uh, business career as well, uh, being in the middle of the teams, shaping teams, creating teams, creating not just high performance team, but high purpose led teams, mm. create teams that reinvent themselves. And I give you an example, Microsoft on, a, on the other car, but in a way, uh, I'm kind of trying to do the same with my own foundation today. I've got a young team with inc and the very diverse team is kind of incredible. And, and being, unable, uh, being able, sorry, to, to hopefully inspire them, to coach them and to inject uh, a, number of the, um, a number of the learnings I had all, all along the ways so that they create by themselves very thoughtful and very driven teams where they can bring the best of themselves every day in what they do and they love what they do so you know talk about engagement and <laughs> well-being i can see the two blocks being there all the time and and that gives me so much energy it gives me energy when i'm in the middle of the team and showing and seeing that team growing you know months after months a year after and you see what they do and say wow this is so amazing <laughs> and how much more they do than by yourself and I, I think that's what gives me an energy and a, that, that will be the last example I share with you. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your strengths. And you can see perhaps, perhaps, <laughs> obviously you are the one talking. When people talk about their strengths, hmm. they change yes. the way they talk. Physically. So their <laughs> voice becomes different. Yes. They become far yeah. more confident, affirmative. Their gestures become different. Yeah. They use their language, body language differently. So what happens very often with this type of exercise, I would usually do it in a group. I would do it in a group of people, usually people who know each other. That'd be so great. the team uh, members, for example. Yes. And what happens mm. is that when people talk about their strengths, everybody wants to listen. Of course. Because these are great stories. Of these course. are interesting stories. Yes. These are stories that actually make sense. Yes. <laughs> and then there is another round usually. Uh -huh when all the people talked yeah. about it yeah. and this is really only can work very well when people know each other well yes isn't then i would ask people to mm. also give other strengths to the same person to the same person yes. and actually yes. build on yes. the story yeah. and go perhaps a little bit further yes. in the story yes so yes. and <laughs> of course then it's much better if you know each other well so yes. at the moment i'm looking for a couple of strengths that yes. i would love to give to you ah really <laughs> but i do <laughs> with obviously with the limitation that i don't necessarily know you that well so <laughs> the bit. strengths i'm looking <laughs> yes. is is a, one of them yeah. is personalization for ah, example. And okay. the reason I would give you personalization yes. is just listening to you and having had a couple of conversations yes. is that you are extremely good in learning about people and really in adjusting and really asking just the right questions. Hmm. So, for example, you've done great homework in preparing for this interview <laughs> with me <laughs> as you were with other people on your podcast. Mm. And you keep changing the questions to actually get more and more Pre and more to the point and precise. more and more <laughs> precise. And that's a really great strength of personalization mm. Thank that you. I'm hearing that's in great. our conversation. And another strength I'm looking for, which yes. I can't find, <laughs> but you know <laughs> because all. there are so many <laughs> of them right of them. now, but I'm going to pick up a joker. <laughs> okay. okay, it's actually the strength of spirituality. Of what? Spirituality. Spirituality. Okay. It is there somewhere, yes, yeah. but so I'm yes. picking up a green card yes, for the yeah, time yeah, being. Yeah. And <laughs> the reason I picked up spirituality is that when we talk about it, it's not necessarily about any religious hmm. irritation. It's really contributing hmm. to the world and this world awareness, hmm. because on numerous occasions when we talked yeah. you keep coming back to this positioning of me and the world mm. and the importance <laughs> of interaction between yes. me and the world whether it's through the ecological mm. uh, awareness for mm -hmm. example or leadership consciousness so i think that's another absolutely amazing strength of yours and we will find the card at some point well thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you don't know. and sorry love it and wonderful and uh, and i believe like you that i think doing that with the team and people know you i think is a wonderful way to mm 
to start really building on your strengths. Absolutely. Which I believe is a core fundamental of, of that philosophy of yeah. leadership as well. And what's even more, what's really important is not to do this type of exercise just as a one-off, because what usually happens in a team, eventually everybody cries. So this I can yeah. promise, yes, <laughs> and the sure. hug, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Yes. So this is great. <laughs> but actually not to stop there, hmm. because what where we do really see changes in mm -hmm. the way we lead in the way the team functions is when this language of strength becomes integrated yeah. so it's not just something you do to make people feel good mm. which is a part of it of course yes, yes. it's really about using the strengths and reconstructing the way our teams function for example on the basis of understanding mm. of each other's strengths of each other's, yes. so yeah. what are your best strengths because we know that if we adjust our work tasks to our best strengths, not just to our competences, and especially not to our weaknesses, Agree. and yeah. manage to align, yes. really align the tasks that we do, the projects that we are responsible for with our best strengths, this is so we, get, we yes. get the so optimal situation yes. of really full engagement and well-being, yeah. and people being <laughs> fully flourishing in their work roles. So it's important not to stop here and keep building on that dynamic of understanding and integrating strengths into functioning. So, even I was talking to Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever on a podcast a few months ago, about the need to scrap the old leadership paradigm of command and control in favor of a more collaborative servant leadership approach, which puts a greater emphasis on purpose, impact, and well-being at work. There's no question that we need a new leadership model. I'm very convinced of that particularly given the impact and trauma of COVID, and we all people are reflecting on that. And you've been using an acronym to describe the, the issues relating to today's workforce, VUCA, V-U-C-A, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Can you talk about some of these workplace changes that you are seeing as a consultant, as deep engage, uh, of course, uh, coach of those organizations? that you've seen having an effect on well-being and how positive psychology coaching can help. Uh, and please, of course, in the discussion, if you also can share a practical tool you've used success during the pandemic and during the pandemic and after, that'd be great. Of course. Yes, of course. Um, we can almost say that VUCA has intensified with the pandemic. Mm. So it's it's been VUCA already yes. for quite a while oh, yeah. and yeah. became just much more VUCA, right? <laughs> <laughs> so changes yeah. are just so yes. rapid, yeah. it's so difficult to plan. It's so difficult to, to even interpret yeah. the data coming back from the mm -hmm. environment, etc. So what we are seeing, of course, much more, we are seeing much more stress mm. overall. Yeah. <laughs> stress linked to this unpredictability, ambiguity, increased very often increased workloads yeah. sometimes or perceived increased work workloads yes, as well yes, yeah. so uh, we are seeing much more social isolation for some mm. parts of the working population so we know during COVID there were people who were more affected than others so younger people Young actually people. got far more affected than yeah. older people and especially younger people females sometimes living on their own as well uh, living on yes, their own yeah, etc yeah, yeah, yeah. males as well in fact yeah, yeah, depending yeah. depending on yeah, them yeah. on, on the demographic situation mm. so we are seeing a lot more isolation and what i found really striking mm -hmm. was the difficulty that some younger people have mm. engaging even in um, face-to-face -face hmm. online meetings yes they're there but they're no longer hmm. showing the face i remember one yes. of uh, an interesting training sessions for one of the big consulting mm. companies where I was training younger yes. younger talents on emotional intelligence. Yes. And I was really struggling to get them to switch their videos on because videos are off or they're an avatar <laughs> or they Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. we're yeah. talking about emotions. Yes. We kind of really do need to at least see the faces. It'd be anyway. nice. <laughs> yes. Well, obviously we, we are yeah. seeing the whole uh, trend of the great resignation yes. and people yeah. losing fundamentally the meaning or projection mm. towards the future, especially mm -hmm. with the same companies, etc. Yeah. Uh, we are seeing also trends of now difficulty of bringing people back to the office. So yes. what is the office mm -hmm. actually offering mm. to people mm. to bring them back? What is the What's reason? The point? What's the What's point the of being back? Yes, et cetera, exactly. Et cetera. So many, many yeah. offers and we can yeah. continue. So uh, in our work, what we found perhaps the most important over the last few years really was to focus on resilience mm. fundamentally mm -hmm. and on meaning, I would yes. say, and yeah. also on some aspects of well-being as well, of mm. course, in our work. So the reason resilience, because yes, I mean, how do you mm. not just cope with stress, but how do you finally thrive 
yes. under conditions of under VUCA yes. conditions and increased stress. So we've been using a lot of the program called Spark Resilience yes. with many <coughs> leaders and teams and individuals all around the world. What is it? Can you just explain a little bit on Spark? Yes, Resilience? of course. Yeah? Spark yeah. Resilience is a program that they originally developed <coughs> about 12, uh, 12 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Originally, it used to be a program for kids. Mm. Oh, <laughs> so interesting. Um, okay. basically <laughs> bringing together lots of positive yeah. psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy yes. skills for the children. Yep. And then the program grew up, mm. <laughs> grew up faced uh, with a demand yeah. from the work work force, workplace, yep. workplaces, yeah, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and actually grew up mm. even more with COVID mm. when got adapted to online environments yep. and at the same time picked up even more skills. So what SPARK is, SPARK is an acronym explaining the process of resilience self. Mm. It's also an acronym that enables us to attach different skills associated with resilience mm. in such a way that to make it easier for people to remember and to use. Yep. S so SPARK stands for stress, yep. perception, affect, response, and knowledge. And knowledge. So okay. a stressful situation mm. is always interpreted. So yep. let's say I'm mm. late for our meeting mm. and I don't have your phone number to call and I'm stuck in traffic. Yep. I'm feeling stressed, but why am I feeling stressed? Well, because my mm. interpretation would be Oh, I should have left earlier, for example. Yes. So this interpretation and not a stressful situation would mm. produce certain affect, yes. the feelings and emotions inside of yep. me, for example, yep, yep, yep. certain reaction, what it is that I do, mm. and certain learning that I actually will that, yeah, take yeah. from that situation. Yes. And so when we work on the development of resilience, we yeah. work on development of different types of skills. Mm. So when we target P, the perception, we are working on the development of cognitive skills, yes. cognitive skills of how do you change that perception. So the cognitive skills mm. may be uh, decatastrophizing, for mm, example, mm, mm, mm. or it may be cognitive diffusion, yes, or yeah. it may be reframing. Yes. So in A, we'll be working on skills associated with emotion mm. management. I see. So Managing your own emotions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Labeling yeah. emotions, for yes. example, is a really powerful yeah. strategy, mm. or using mindfulness, for mm. example. Mm. Uh, in R, we'll be working on skills associated with behavior, so mm. more behavior yeah. change, so things yeah. like, for example, assertiveness, Mm. Uh, skills or uh, goal setting skills yep. and in K we'll be working on more metacognitive skills mm -hmm. like for example development of a more flexible mindset yep. or meaning making or meaning finding yep. etc things like this mm. so basically spark mm. is a framework mm. that enables us to understand what's going on yep. and at the same time enables us to learn associated skills hmm. and not everybody would need all of the skills because some skills might be just completely natural to you yes yeah. but it's about also pinpointing and understanding what skills would really make a difference for you hmm. so. well, super super helpful super helpful because i think many people have a very hard time again to uh to actually apprehend what resiliency is all about and uh, yes. making sense of that for themselves uh, and giving them some practical tools to uh, to actually somehow manage that is, is quite <laughs> critical, I think. Very important at the moment, absolutely. You know, we've been talking about well-being and engagement, of course, but increasingly people want more than that. They, more, they want more than well-being. They want to find a purpose in their jobs, in their lives, actually. Mm. So they are seeking happiness. And I know you define happiness uh, It's part also of a lot of literature existing on that as the combination of hedonism and eudaimonia. Uh, I know this is a, a challenging world, by the way. <laughs> Can you elaborate on the definition of different meanings of happiness and elaborate on those terms, of course, and particularly as well in different cultures like mm -hmm. American and French, maybe, because I've been living in those kind of two civilizations worlds myself for many years of my life. And I can see <laughs> I can see the the, the, the sensitivity and uh, the, the variances we have in apprehending that, actually. <laughs> of course. That's a, that's a really complex question. So yes. let's start with definition. Definition, yes. <laughs> okay. first. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking very often about hedonic well-being and eudaimonic well-being. Yes. So hedonic well-being or hedonic well-being or happiness, in fact. Sometimes we use happiness, sometimes well-being, and I'll come back to yeah. that. Okay. So this is really fundamentally about feeling good, yes. feeling well. Yes. So being satisfied mm -hmm. with our lives, so the cognitive component, and having more positive emotions and negative emotions, yes. so the emotional component. Yes. So that's one part. And this is 
is really where we have most of research on happiness and well-being is in using this particular definition. Mm. So when we are comparing different countries, for yes. example, yeah. we will be comparing them and saying that Denmark, for example, is happier yes. than France. Mm-hmm. The country be in the world, etc. Exactly, yes, yeah. one of the, <laughs> yeah. mm, sometimes it's Iceland, sometimes it's changes, Finland, yes, yeah. sometimes <laughs> etc. They, they keep competing, okay? yes. so depending on the year. Yeah. So that we will be using this hedonic well-being definition, mm. subjective well-being yes. definition, another name for it, yeah. to measure. Yeah. Then there is another component to well-being, and this is really a component influenced originally by philosophical yes. literature. Yes. So we're talking about eudaimonia. So what's eudaimonia? It's, uh, if you translate directly, it's kind of good spirit. Mm. And there is a slight distinction between what Aristotle meant by eudaimonia yeah. and what we mean nowadays. What we mean nowadays by this notion of eudaimonic well-being, it's really about going beyond just feeling good. It's mm. not just about waking up in the morning and feeling good in your body or yep. looking forward to the day. It's about something beyond yourself. Mm. So really there are two major components, I would say, to that. One is really self-actualization, so yes. mm-hmm. going further, going mm. beyond, stretching yourself, mm-hmm. so, self, so sort of trans, um, <laughs> transcendent almost, of self-transcendent yeah. tendency. Fulfilling yourself as well. Exactly, fulfilling yeah. yourself. And yeah. another one is really contribution. Yes. So it's doing something for others, yes. for the world. For the world. In yes. fact, of course there are many more components yeah. to it and there's yes. a whole big book written or edited <laughs> yes <laughs> on the subject uh, matter with different definitions but i would usually stick to this too and there is a big difference between these two hedonic yes. in the morning because one is about fundamentally homostatic well-being mm. and another one is about breaking that homostasis yes and in the moment of breaking homostasis mm-hmm. you might not be feeling that particularly good yeah yeah <laughs> but at the same time it feels meaningful mm. and so your question about different, I would say, interpretations of oh, these notions yes. in different cultures. Yes. After eudaimonic well-being, uh, there aren't that many sort of issues interpretation because it's a very new notion to the vast majority of people. So people, I would say, kind of take it for granted, the, the scientific interpretation. Yep. But of course, when I talk about hedonic well-being, there are many words yes. we would use naturally. Yes. Well-being, subjective well-being, happiness, etc. And if you just stay to, to mm-hmm. kind of at the level of this words, well-being and happiness, in fact, they don't necessarily mean the same no. in different languages. Yes, yes. So, for example, if I spoke, yeah. if I speak English, yeah. if we compare well-being and happiness, well-being is this kind of really big notion, yeah. right? And if you type well-being on Google, for example, <laughs> you would you would actually see lots and lots of models, yes. especially subjective well-being or something or hedonic well-being. Lots yeah. and lots of different models. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a very sort of so, sort of encompassing notion. Yeah. And happiness is more associated with this hedonic state, mm. feeling happy, feeling yes. sorry, yeah. <laughs> feeling happy, feeling yeah. well in yourself. Yeah. In English, if we switch to French, yeah. Something else happens. <laughs> yes. So we will type bien-être, bien-être, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just look at the images associated. What will we see? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see relaxation, massage, meditation, massage, a bit of meditation. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the notion of bien-être yes. is a much more hedonic notion, right? Exactly. And the notion of happiness, hmm. bonheur. Bonheur. It's a far more complex philosophical Absolutely. notion very often put forward, yes, right? Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> even those two very small differences already highlight something. And I, I can bring some yeah, other yeah, languages no, no, into no, the sure, story. The if I add the uh, well-being <laughs> in Russian, for example, that yes. would be Blagopalucia. Uh-huh. An, uh, and this an, and this is a notion yeah. which is very often associated with material well-being, mm. far more than just Emotional, emotional well-being, etc. Spirituality, etc. Yes. Yes, and yeah. I keep playing with these notions yeah. in all different <laughs> languages, and very often finding that yes. what we mean by them just really is quite yes. different across the globe. No, that's uh, that's <laughs> amazing. Uh, I've been spending, you know, many years of my life as well working with global team, international teams from all over the world, and I've uh, been always, you know, uh, fascinated by how much we can be lost in translation <laughs> in some basic world that seems simple, but actually means very different things to people. So talking about happiness, you're involved in a very special and very exciting project with the government of Bhutan, (laughs) a nation which has a unique approach to happiness and which developed the idea of a gross national happiness. So the GNP for happiness to guide the government. So what did you learn from this incredible project? Yeah, that was a fascinating, absolutely fascinating invention. I learned so much from it. Yeah. It was a couple of years back, already a few years back, and I was not involved in defining yeah. cross-national happiness concept. Mm. That was already well-defined yes. because yeah. it is the first country yeah. that defined and measures 
well-being, the level of population. However, I was involved in bringing together a group of international experts mm. and producing a report for the United Nations on how mm. this notion of happiness and well-being from Bhutan yep. can, can, can actually inform public policy mm. across the yes, world. Yes. So I've been really working specifically on the development of public policy recommendations yes. based on this project. Yep. And uh, what did I learn? Well, uh, the, probably the basic thing, the most interesting, is the whole notion of sustainable happiness that yep. we can actually mm. we get from Bhutan. What's sustainable happiness? Mm. <laughs> Okay, it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> because of course. Because yeah. sustainable for the individual and sustainable for whom? For the planet. Yeah. Because if there is no notion of sustainability, mm -hmm. well, there will not be happiness yeah. uh, in a very yeah, yeah, close future, yeah, yeah, in fact. For sure, so for the sure. whole notion of sustainable happiness, and they were the, really mm. the country that advocate the concept and bring it to the attention yes. of the United Nations, yeah. that sustainability and happiness, in fact, are not not contrasting notions that notions have to work hand in hand yes. sustainable for whom sustainable yes. for the human beings sustainable for the planet yep. in order to also be yes. sustainable for the human beings yeah. and of course there is another kind of level and layer yeah. of the sustainable yeah. well-being yeah. it's also how do we sustain well-being yeah. what are the means we can use for ourselves to sustain well-being in ourselves so that brings us to the whole notion of yeah. skills and competences to develop etc yeah. and lots of discipline and another point that I learned mm. is that the importance, in fact, of public policy, mm. public policy, organizational policy, yep. and by sometimes by very simply putting some relatively straightforward rules mm. in, place, in place or policies yeah. in place, yeah. we can really facilitate and change those well-being conditions for the individual. So that's another yeah. important learning, I would say. No, it's, it's an amazing discussion. We could go on and on this <laughs> one, because when you think about, of course, climate change, and you think about now uh, many countries in the West, you know, finding out that indeed the people who are going to suffer the most are all those countries in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of sustainable happiness makes tons of sense. And I think we have to, to reflect on that. Absolutely. No, Elena, uh, coming to an end, so last couple of questions. Talking about cultural sensitivity, we discussed about, okay, uh, and, and you, you've been someone, I must say, people don't know, but uh, you were born in Latvia and you have some Russian roots, but you've been living many years in the UK, in France as well, and you've lived in many other places in the world as well. So you've been pretty global as a citizen. So when I I must admit that when I talk myself about positive psychology, leadership, positive leadership in my home country in France, and I would say in Europe as well, pretty much in many countries in Europe, I hear some skepticism on how rosy, idealistic this leadership philosophy theory is, and that it does not address you know, the real tough problems you have to address in the business world as a manager, tough moments where you have to you know, make tough decisions. Actually, my own experience has shown me that a positive leader, a truly positive leader, can do a much better job than a conventional leader addressing the toughest situations in the business life. So can you help us debunk this myth of positive psychology, positive leadership mm -hmm. being uh, not actually uh, relevant mm -hmm. for business issues? <laughs> well, I think... Uh, it very much depends on how you define positive leadership. Yes. And what model you would take as a core. So, for example, we can take some of the sort of most traditional models of positive leadership and focus on the positive relationship and positive climate, for yep. example, and uh, positive communication, which is great. And here it's really all positive. In yep. fact, it's more complicated than that, of course, yep. but it just sounds very positive. And sometimes when they bring this concept, mm -hmm. leaders are petrified. It's yes. Like, okay, uh, listen. Sometimes I need to fire somebody, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes yes. I need to make cuts. Yeah. Sometimes I need to make ready. So yeah. it's positive, yes, I can express it in a positive way, but that just does not go far enough yes. for me. Yeah. So there is another notion of positive leadership out you very often use mm. in terms of positive leadership is about, and that's a model we've developed with Evgeny Osin, mm -hmm. it's about fundamentally really sort of tightening up and developing your own personal resources, mm. but also your resources as a motivator, where which means do you motivate? Yes. How do you motivate using intrinsic means, mm. meaning relationships yes. and uh, mastery and mm -hmm. uh, meaning, for example, mm -hmm. rather than extrinsic means. That's mm. another one. Mm. And then perhaps there is another layer, and that's yep. my 
leadership model that I really prefer, positive leadership model. And yep. this one comes from Bob Quinn. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about positive leadership is uh, fundamentally being able to manage mm. contrasting tensions. Yes. Very interesting model, very different, mm -hmm. in fact, because it means that positive, it's not just about being nice. No. It's about being able to hold things which are yeah. contradictory. Yes. So growth and stability, for yes. example. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, creativity <laughs> and procedural compliance. Yes. Audacity and humility. Yes. And being able <laughs> to speak yes. both of these languages. Absolutely. And most as if really positive, what means positive, is being able to speak the language of tradition mm. rather than throw it in a bin. Yes. <laughs> and everything yes. that we know yeah. from the yeah. hard management science. Yes. And the same time, mm. speak and use the language of modernity, mm. meaning creativity and openness, openness yep. to opinion, yes. involving others, coaching conversation, etc. Yep. In being able to bring these two together, mm. both being positive, in fact, yes. and the positive being also the outcome of balancing those contradictory tensions. Yes. And in fact, <coughs> all of these positives can become negative mm. if taken too far. Yeah. So creativity yeah. taken too far yeah. becomes chaos. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or yeah. organizational compliance yeah. taken too, ca too far bureaucracy becomes and bureaucracy, yeah. yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about being able to hold, integrate, and use yes. this sort of competing, mm -hmm. competing positions. Yes. And that's what positive leadership is about. And when they bring this mm. notion mm. of holding those tensions, contrasting tensions, mm -hmm. somehow everything in the room changes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow every single leader I've ever spoken to yeah. or presented this model to just said, yeah, that's exactly what I seem to be well, doing dealing with most of the time yes. is holding those contrasting tensions, yes. but also being aware when I'm going in the overdrive Too far. this way yes. or that way. Yeah. No, thanks so much. I think it's great that you addressed that elephant in a room <laughs> because he's there. And I think indeed, that authenticity you can bring yourself as a leader in those tough moments, which happen all the time, by the way, in a business life and personal lives as well, Absolutely. is super critical in uh, building on the strengths of others, yourself, and making sense situation collectively uh, to, to stay aligned on whatever is the purpose, the, the North Star of the organization of that team. But positivity is not just about being a nice person in a room. <laughs> not. Uh, no, last question. Uh, you know, an important one for all the listeners, I guess, Ilona. Uh, what role do you see, you know, positive psychology coaching will be having in the workplace in the future? And, and what, would be the, uh, what would be the advice you give to all of the listeners to take a first step <laughs> in their lives to embrace it? Where do we start with that? <laughs> to close the dialogue. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question. I know, but I know that. I think, you can, <laughs> sorry. Yes. No, no, good. I think in the current very transformative, transformative period of time that we are living in, uh, positive psychology coaching and positive psychology based training are incredibly important. Mm. Absolutely. And I think they will be still playing a very important, significant role in years to come. Yeah. However, uh, it is not about discarding mm. other ways of yes. coaching or <laughs> other ways of training, but rather about integrating. Mm. Because positive psychology coaching is appropriate for some specific questions, mm. for some specific outcomes. So when we are dealing with resilience, when we are dealing with engagement, mm. when we are dealing with well-being, or even with meaning, mm. which is like really the core question, I think both positive psychology coaching and positive psychology training mm. can really provide us with huge amount of tools, resources, scientific understanding, because we haven't really talked about the science, but all of those tools and practices and models yeah. are science-based, which is pretty important, right? <laughs> yeah. If you really want mm -hmm. to kind of try uh, sort of test and learn and learn from this experience. So in order to ad address these type of questions, this type of worker questions, positive psychology coaching and training mm. would be extremely appropriate. Mm. And where to start? Yeah. Well, where to start, uh, I think, start by reading. Mm -hmm. Start by reading critically. Yes. So start <laughs> by reading beyond the pop books. Mm. <laughs> if you are actually coming across an interpretation of research, look at perhaps alternative interpretation. <laughs> so to try digging as well, because positive psychology. What's beautiful about this 
subject matter and why I'm still really, really passionate about it, it is a scientific discipline. Yeah. Scientific discipline means mm. the conclusions can mm -hmm. be questioned. Yeah. They can be challenged. Yeah. And it, sometimes they actually can be flipped mm -hmm. upside down with the new science arising. So which is why I think the first starting point is to read critically, mm -hmm. to go to the bottom of the information, to look for scientific publications, and of course then bring it back and experiment. Mm -hmm. Because of course there are two levels, many, may, many more levels, but at least two levels yeah. of integration of information. One is a cognitive level, another one is experiential, <laughs> of course. So hmm. read yep. and, play. and play. That would be my <laughs> well, conclusion. Well, that's a wonderful uh, closing, I think. Ilona and thank you so much for having played with me with some cards <laughs> but also having done a fantastic job of working all of our listeners on this wonderful uh, trajectory and travel you've been having yourself and I also want to thank Martin Seligman for having this cup of coffee with you a few years back and asking you that precise question that got you here today so thank you so much it was wonderful thank you that was a pleasure